straight ahead on Law & Crime Daily. Former USA Olympic coach John Getter commits suicide as authorities announce dozens of charges. The athletes are waiting justice since Larry Nassar is sentencing. We know that what happened was extremely corrupt. The hefty bail set for an army veteran accused of breaking into skyscrapers to take daring photos. You want a crime spree, Your Honor. State prosecutors appeal Derek Chauvin's trial date as reports surface of a federal grand jury hearing possible civil rights violation. Plus, who will the jury believe in the Wisconsin no-body murder trial? Was Victoria Prokopovich murdered? Or investigators say might be the first victim of NASA. I grew up in small town Michigan, and at five years old, the girl down the street from me invited me to bring a friend day at our local gymnastics club. Apparently, I had a little bit of talent, and by eight years old, I was getting ready to compete. Sarah says that was when she met two men who would play major roles in her life, Olympic gold medal winning coach John Getter and volunteer athletic trainer Larry Nassar. And in a sense, we all grew up together. John Geddert was in his early 30s. Larry was in his 20s. I was eight. We were all starting out with our futures ahead of us, but things went very wrong. Sarah says she had an intense regimen training 30 hours a week at Geddert's gym. Nassar was there to tape up her injuries. I went to his wedding, right? I, you know, he came to my birthday parties. It was somebody I loved and trusted and our entire community loved and trusted. It wasn't until she was 37 years old and read about gymnasts coming forward with sexual assault allegations in the Indy Star that Sarah realized what happened to her as a child. To have that moment of, oh my God, that's what that was. And the entire paradigm of my life exploded. Sarah is an attorney and used her knowledge of the criminal justice system to help guide hundreds of young athletes as they faced their abuser. After my bath, you rewarded me for my generous participation in your study by having me lay naked on the treatment table in the living room of your sparse one bedroom apartment as you massaged the entirety of my 12 year old body, suggesting that I relax as you slipped your adult fingers in and out and in and out of my body. At the time, Sarah was only known as victim number 125. Nassar was sentenced to 40 to 175 years in prison for sexually abusing young girls. You were the good cop to coach John Geddard's bad cop. When he broke us mentally and physically, depriving us of water on a hot summer's day in the unair conditioned gym, or pushing us to practice on broken bones, you were the one who stepped in. USA Gymnastics suspended Gettard after testimony like Sarah's poured in. He retired in 2018. Then on Thursday, Michigan's Attorney General announced 24 criminal charges against Gettard, including human trafficking of a minor. The allegations are from 2008 to 2016, including the time Gettard was head coach of the U.S. Women's Olympic team, winning a gold medal in London. But as Gettard was scheduled to turn himself in and be arraigned in Eaton County Court, authorities say he committed suicide. Police found his body at an interstate rest area. The Attorney General nominee, Merrick Garland, said he supports releasing the results of the DOJ's handling of the investigation into the abuse. It is about time. <laughs> it is about time. We've been asking for that for so long. We still do not have answers, and we deserve answers. And we know that what happened was extremely corrupt. Sarah decided to go public with her story at ESPN's 2018 ESPY Awards. Since then, she advocates for sexual assault survivors across the country. When you're eight, your mind is not fully formed, and it can take decades to reconcile. We've been going state to state to attempt not only to extend the statutes going forward, but to provide these look-back windows. So I am. This defendant 
has been brought to justice. I've just signed your death warrant. Nassar is appealing his sentence, saying the judge was biased for allowing every accuser to give a victim impact statement. His request for a new judge has already been denied. The only thing I ask you is to let go of that 12-year-old girl, give her permission to say it's okay, I didn't report it, because you know at 12, you are powerless. I was victim 125. I am attorney Sarah Klein. That's really powerful, Terry. Thank you. Joining us today is former federal prosecutor Gene Rossi. Gene, the thing that annoys me a little here, it seems like the prosecutors or the officers handled him with a little bit of kid gloves. Why was he able to turn himself in rather than them going out and arresting him, especially when we were talking about human trafficking charges? Well, I'll tell you this right now. If it were federal charges and I was the prosecutor, I wouldn't give him a New York minute to think about it. I would have had him arrested at 6 a.m. or at any time during the day and night. What the state prosecutors did is, is, is extremely rare for this type of crime. They cut him a break, and I'm wondering if his former position of power may have influenced and clouded their judgment. He should have been arrested, not given the courtesy of self-surrender. Yeah, not for these types of charges. That's that's peculiar. Terry, while these women will not see Getter serve time for these charges, could they still have a civil case against him or his estate? Yes, Brian, they could, because instead of bringing the case personally against Getter, now that he's no longer with us, the case could be brought against the estate. We saw the exact same thing in the Jeffrey Epstein case. The women here are seeking damages for physical and mental emotional abuse that Gettert caused. I mean, the attorney general even said that many of these women have sustained long damages because of what he's done. They have eating disorders. Some of them have even committed suicide. So, you know, the fact that these two men work together really showed that they were hurting these women in many ways. Thank you both for your contribution to the story. Of course, we'll keep an eye out to see if that civil case ever pops up. Still ahead on Law and Crime Daily, should another charge be added to the ex-cops accused of murdering George Floyd? But first, he said, catch me if you can. Welcome back. Prosecutors in Ohio went to court this week asking to increase bail for an army veteran accused of breaking into high rises and landmarks to take photos. And Jeanette Levy is here with the latest on the Law and Crime exclusive. Yeah, Brian, since we last talked about this case, Isaac Wright has been moved from a jail in Arizona to a jail in Cincinnati, Ohio. He's actually facing another burglary charge in that city, along with a burglary charge in Louisiana, and more charges could be coming in cities across the country. Isaac Wright walked into a courtroom in a jail jumpsuit, a stark difference from what he's used to doing, scaling landmarks to take photos. Still deception, fleeing from the police. The man known on Instagram only as Drifter Shoots was about to get out of jail after posting 10% of his bail. He'd also be locked down at his dad's house on electronic monitoring, but prosecutors asked for an emergency hearing to raise his bail. He has a military background, Your Honor, which is both a source of sympathy or compassion for him, but also a source of concern. The state does not know uh, what his motivations are, what his experience is, but we do know what his training is, and his training, make training makes him at least potentially very dangerous for our community. Wright had special forces training before he got out of the military last April. Prosecutors say he traveled across the country eluding them when he knew there was a warrant out for his arrest. Wright's attorney argued his current bail was high enough. This is bizarre. All these people here for a nationwide manhunt for someone that posts pictures on Instagram, it, it is not adding up. He has no criminal record. Now, the judge who's actually presiding over this case was out of town, so another judge presided over that emergency hearing. She raised the bail from that $30,000 at 10% to $400,000 at 10%. That means that Isaac Wright will have to post $40,000 to get out of jail. Wright's lawyer thinks it's unreasonable, and he plans to file a writ of habeas corpus to challenge that new bond. Brian? 
Thanks, Anjanette. Back to break down the new heights of the Drifter Shoots case is former federal prosecutor Gene Rossi and co-host Terry Austin. Terry, this rubs me the wrong way, asking for increased bail, and it kind of sounds like Drifter Shoots is being punished for his service. By the prosecutor's logic, anyone arrested who has any kind of armed service training should get a higher bail than civilians, and that ain't right. Well, you know, Brian, I think the reason for the higher bail is the fact that Wright has an uncanny ability to slip away. The authorities started tracking him in Florida using his license plate, and then they tracked him to Louisiana and Texas and New Mexico. So each time he got away, they finally caught up to him in Arizona. So I think the reason the judge raised the bail was because he is this person who can slip away. And don't forget, he had the training from the SEER school, which stands for Survival Evasion Resistance, and escape. So he knows how to escape if he has to. So, Gene, 30000 to 400000 I mean, in Brooklyn, you've got to at least stab someone to get that kind of bail. Is this a little too high for someone who's merely breaking it in, breaking into these facilities and taking photos? Yes. Yes, it is. Here's the thing. They could have kept the... Uh the amount that they had before, which was much lower. But they could have done an electronic monitoring, third-party custody. They could have done a lot of extra stuff. But I agree with your point that he's essentially being penalized for the Army uh, Army service. However, Terry's right. I can't pronounce S-E-R-E -E as quickly as Terry. But it does involve ability to escape and evade. <laughs> I got to say, he picked the wrong nickname. He should be called Spider-Man. <laughs> and Jeanette, you <laughs> spoke with uh, Isaac Spider-Man Wright recently, uh, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure he would really like the Spider-Man thing, but, um, you know, yeah, I'll, I'll ask him about it the next time he calls. Um, I did speak with him. He called me from jail, and he said he couldn't really discuss specifics about the case, but he claims that he's an artist. He says he really wasn't eluding anyone. He says he planned to turn himself in. He knew there was a warrant out for his arrest. He said he didn't know it was a nationwide warrant, but he was going to turn himself in after he finished a job in Las Vegas. But the police say they don't believe that's necessarily true. They say they called a hotel in Texas, told him, them they would be coming, not to say anything to him. They say that that hotel worker actually tipped right off that they were coming for him and that he left with his girlfriend. That girlfriend now also faces a burglary charge in Louisiana. She's accused of helping him out. All right, well, let's see how that bail or bond works out for him. Thank you, everyone. Coming up on Law & Crime Daily, how would you vote if you were on a jury in a murder trial with no body? Plus, is a federal grand jury secretly hearing evidence in the George Floyd case? The new report of testimony of possible civil rights violations against Derek Chauvin next. The Minnesota Attorney General is preparing to argue why one of the ex-cops accused with murdering George Floyd should face another charge. Derek Chauvin's trial for second-degree murder and second-degree manslaughter charges is scheduled to begin on March 8th. But prosecutors will go before the state's appeals court on Monday asking to reinstate the third-degree murder charge. According to local media, federal prosecutors have already convened a grand jury to look into possible civil rights violations committed by Chauvin. Sources say four Minneapolis police officers have already been called to testify. Prosecutors are reportedly looking at Chauvin's entire history of employment. Let's bring in former federal prosecutor Gene Rossi and Terry Austin to discuss the possible federal charges against Derek Chauvin. Gene, like I said, supposedly the grand jury isn't just looking at the death of George Floyd, but Chauvin's past altogether. Now, from my understanding, federal rights cases are usually called pattern and practice cases. Is that what we're looking at for Chauvin? Oh, absolutely. Um, bear in mind that Derek Chauvin's alleged conduct regarding uh, George Floyd, that could be a criminal event in itself. The pattern and practice actually helps a lot. And what they're looking at, from what I've read, is that Mr. Chauvin's had a, a boatload of accusations over his career with the department. Uh, I think he has 10 to 15 complaints. I could be wrong on the exact number, but it's a lot. So they're probably pulling those files, interviewing those witnesses, fellow officers, to see if this George Floyd alleged homicide is a one-time event. 
or he has what they call other crimes evidence that could be part of an indictment that shows a pattern practice. I will say this about the civil rights crowd at the Department of Justice. They are very thorough. They're very ethical. They don't, they don't just, you know, charge people willy-nilly. And they're, they're, if they bring charges, they're going to be, they're going to have some pretty solid evidence. Absolutely. But it may take a, they, it may take time, though. These are not easy cases to prove. Now, Terry, what kind of civil rights violations could Chauvin be accused of here? Well, you know, the DOJ is investigating whether or not Floyd's 14th Amendment rights were violated. You know, his right to life, his right to liberty, equal protection. And like Gene said, they are looking at these other cases. There's one case that involves a 14-year-old boy. So we'll see what happens. But it seems to be there's a lot of evidence out there. Absolutely. And be sure to tune in to the Law and Crime Network for gavel to gavel coverage of Chauvin's trial. Law and Crime's Jesse Weber is here to tell us about the conviction of one former officer on his new show, Prime Crime. Hey, Brian. Yeah, we're focusing on the Newman Raja case. An officer in Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, opens fire and kills stranded motorist Corey Jones. Very high profile. A lot of people were following this one. And unlike other cases, we actually have that shooting captured on recorded audio. Stop. I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. Yeah. Oh my God. So, how exactly did this happen and what could happen next for Raja? Tune in to Law and Crime. Thanks, Jesse. We'll make sure to do that on Friday. When we come back, a jury is deliberating. Will a husband accused of murdering his wife spend the rest of his life in prison? Or is he an innocent man? Our analysis after the break. Welcome back. A Wisconsin jury is deliberating the fate of a husband accused of murdering his wife and making her body disappear. James Prokopovich is charged with first-degree intentional homicide of Victoria Prokopovich. She's been missing since 2013, and her body has never been found. Investigators say it was part of the defendant's plan to be with his new girlfriend, Catherine Friday. Friday and the defendant were charged with lying about when they met, but Friday died before her sentencing. Prosecutors say the defendant had the means, motive, and opportunity. And witness one, as I indicated, corroborated Jim still saying, 100% certain his wife is dead and she is not coming back. You heard from Rich Jones, the sludge ponds, if somebody's in there, they're not getting out. You heard the defendant, no blood, no teeth. It's the fact that Kathy Friday and Jim Prokopovitz took it upon themselves because they knew they had something to hide. And again, even a five-year-old would know, what do you do if you do something wrong? They intentionally conspired and lied about the relationship, but that they, the relationship was the motive, and Jim was ready to move on. And that's exactly what he did. There is no circumstantial evidence. Vicki had 10 years to plan her leg. She said in 2003, next time I do it, no one's going to find me. She meant it. They want to use the idea that he got together with Kathy Friday, and that was his motive. Based on what? They called her every three, four, five years. They're trying to twist two people who've lost somebody dear to them, who came together. The full picture is she left. We don't know where she is. We don't know if she's living somewhere else. We don't know if she's alive or dead. Joining us one last time is Gene Rossi and Terry Austin. Gene, what about the defense's closing arguments makes you think they won this trial? Well, number one, when you don't have a body, that's a big problem. Number two, the motive seems very weak. If, in fact, Victoria uh, became, uh, you know, they couldn't find her, and then he met Catherine Friday, there goes, you know, the motive usually occurs before the murder, not after. And the last thing is, there's no forensic evidence. There's no diary. There are no notes. There's no admission. There's just odd conduct after her disappearance. 
by the two, but that's not enough to get over beyond a reasonable doubt. Yeah. I got to tell you, this could be a, an acquittal or a hung jury. I could be wrong. I would say the same. Terry, same question, but let's look at it from the other side. What about the prosecutor's closing makes you think they won? I don't think they won, actually. And Gene basically just said why I don't think the prosecution is going to win this. Look, we all know that the standard is beyond a reasonable doubt. And I don't think the prosecution met that standard. They couldn't explain what the intent was to what Brian, uh, Gene was saying. There's no question that they had this affair after Vicky disappeared. So where's the intent there? And also, you know, the fact that there's no evidence here, I don't think she explained it enough. I don't think that the jury is going to feel comfortable convicting him. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, it's the lack of forensics for me. If he did, in fact, kill her, where'd he do it? Thanks for joining us, Gene and Terry. And thank you for joining us here at Law and Crime Daily. We'll see you next time as we discuss justice in America.